Medical Partial Association. Medical Partial Association was registered in August of 1979. Uh, these days, every state in the country has maybe two or three dozens of non-governmental organizations working in the field of mental health. Southern states have larger number. The northern states too have many voluntary organizations doing number of things, you know, um, dealing with anxiety, depression, suicide, call lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was not so in the early 1970s. There were no non-government organizations to deal with problems of persons suffering from various mental disorders, and that's how a medical pass the re registration of medical partial association as the first and then the only uh, non-governmental organization in the field of mental health is very important. Although the idea of starting this kind of an organization was there for several years, uh, it uh, emerged in the St. Mark's Cathedral of Bangalore, but it ultimately uh, took shape in 1972 when it was registered as a non-governmental organization. To be exact, it was on the 3rd of August, 1972. So the committee of the Medical Pastoral Association decided that we will have an observance of one year. Six months prior to the, 6th of, uh, the 3rd of August uh, 2022 and six months after that. So we began this uh, uh, observ observance of the Golden Jubilee from February. Uh, there are numerous programs. One of the programs which has been regularly going on is the series of Golden Jubilee Lectures. And today's is the fourth. Uh, in the series. We hope to have 12 of these special lectures. Uh, this is to promote uh, the mental health awareness and various other themes on which the Medical Partial Association is working. So once again, uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, we have large number of people who attend from various places, but uh, many people write to us saying that, oh, we were busy on that day, we couldn't attend that. And some very, from the very first uh, lecture, we have made it a point to edit it, record it, and the recorded uh, uh, talks would be available on Medical Bachelor Association, uh, Facebook page, and YouTube, etc. And once our website is finally ready, uh, it is currently under repair, etc. All these talks would be available. Uh, back to you, the moderator. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, I would request Dr. Israel David to uh, do a prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, for being, we acknowledge your intellectual and inspiring presence of this evening. We thank you, Lord, for creating human beings with full of abilities, potentials, and the possibility towards self-actualization. We also thank you for enabling each one of us to be conscious of the coordination and relationship between mind and body, and also the conflicts between mind and body. Lord, we thank you for the available healing resources and medicines towards experiencing positive mental health, in spite of obstacles, curls, factors, and persons that affect our This evening, celebrating the golden jubilee of MPA. Thank you, Lord, for helping the management committee, the president, the vice president, the secretary, and Dr. Morgan Isaac to raise these series of lectures. As we listen to Dr. Sanchez, enable us to understand topic mind, body, medicine, and and collectively to respond to the issues emerging out of it. We seek your presence, blessings, directions, and guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, sir. Uh, by the way, Dr. Israel David is a managing committee member. Uh, now, moving on, uh, I would request Dr. Ajit Bide, our vice president, to introduce uh, the guest speaker for today's uh, lecture series for uh, Dr. Ajit, over to you, sir. Right. Uh, this photo might surprise everybody, not the least Dr. Sanjay himself. Dr. Sanjay Fatke is our invited faculty, our invited speaker today. Sanjay is a senior consultant in neuropsychiatry at the Jahangir Hospital and the Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital at Pune. He is also the chair at, the, at their Center for Behavioral Medicine. Sanjay proposed to the Indian Psychiatric Society that we have a body to look into mind-body medicine. And this proposal came into fruition in uh, 2019. And ever since then, he has been chair of the Indian Psychiatric <laughs> Society's National Force on Mind-Body Medicine. Sanjay formerly was the associate professor and co-investigator at the ICMR Center for Advanced Research on Mental Health Consequences of uh, Mental Health Consequences of Disasters. He has been faculty in Maharashtra at both Aurangabad and later at Pune, which is his uh, the place of his alma mater. Incidentally, he's also an alumnus of Nimhans, and at least two of his teachers, Professor Srinivas Murthy and Professor Mohan Isaac, are present today. We were hoping that our managing committee member and uh, Sanjay's other teacher, Dr. Mohan uh, Matthew Varghese, could have been present today, but he's held up in a conference uh, in a, at, a, at a different place. Sanjay is the formerly the uh, sorry is a principal investigator of more than 30, fifty international clinical research projects. These projects, including clinic, include clinical trials of new medicines and of new technologies in the field of mental health. Sanjay, with a deep interest in yoga and in the Indian systems, is a visiting faculty in Germany and has initiated the Indo-German collaboration on the neuroscience of yoga. Uh, this photograph that you see over here was courtesy Dr. Mohan Isaac, and Dr. Mohan Isaac got it fairly recently from Dr. Uh, Hari Shetty of Mumbai. And you see over there, Sanjay himself, as a young man in 1994, when the, the, the impetus was on the young, budding, coming, upcoming psychiatrist. And you see Sanjay over there. Sanjay, I'm sure this is a surprise for you. Perhaps you have a copy of the photograph. If not, Dr. Mohan Isaac would be very happy to share it with you. Sanjay today is going to speak to us on mind-body medicine and its importance in mental health. This topic was mooted very much by the chair of our academic and public service committee, uh, Ellen, uh, officially known as Ms. Pranalini Shinde. Uh, unfortunately, Pranalini might be held up today because of some personal emergency, uh, but this topic was suggested by her. And when this topic came up, I could think of nobody more suitable than Sanjay, who has so passionately been involved in the relationship of the mind to the body and vice versa. Over to you, Sanjay. We are looking forward to a feast from you. So at the outset, my heartfelt thanks and uh, gratitude to the MPA. And uh, I'm back actually, Ajit Bide, sir, as you said, I'm back actually to the late 80s when I was a Resident, I started my residency in the RSM unit and later in the MKI unit, you know, so with Professor Srinivas Murthy and Professor Mohan Isaac, I started my very life in psychiatry in the late 80s. And of course, at that time, uh, the only NGO which was working as Professor Mohan Isaac rightly said, which I knew of, was the Medical Pastoral Association, you know, so my whole introduction uh, to psychiatry, Premier Institute, Nimans and the premier NGO working in uh, mental health at that time was to MPA. So it's a wonderful uh, privilege. Thank you so much to bring me to this. And uh, I will make my best effort. As we know that uh, uh, Professor Muthi and Professor Mohan Isaac were very important key people to bring in psychiatry into the public health fold. And uh, Ajit Bide, I fondly call him Professor Ajit Bide. You know, I think he's people's professor to my mind. Uh, he has been a very strong supporter in the Indian Psychiatric Society to bring forth uh, 
this mind body medicine task force so let me just start my sharing my presentation Okay, so can you see my slides, please? Can someone? Yes. yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So let me start. So in next 40 minutes or so, and that was what my discussion with Ronaldini, I will try to make my best effort to give you an overview of mind-body medicine and whatever value that it adds to our armamentorium in the mental health. As we all know, we have a very challenging time for the healthcare sector in general, large number of patients waiting to receive quality services. Society has expectation of improved outcomes and better quality of life from us. There is also a aspect of huge caregiver burden. And I'm not talking just about the burden that the relatives have, but even the health professionals. You know, it is pretty well known that health professionals themselves also face lot of burden and uh, there is a lot of burnout in the professional themselves. So this is on the, you can see on the challenge side, you know, the numbers, the quality, the type of issues which are there on the more positive side. There have been several scientific advancements in the last couple of decades in particular. And very importantly, as we notice, all of us notice that people have an eagerness to be active participants incrementally in their own health care. So I will try to uh, mainly focus on what is the value addition of mind-body medicine to the field of mental health in general and overall health sector in particular. These are the few presentation points. I know that there are going to be several students also attending this presentation. So I tried to put it in a bit of a structured way uh, so my presentation points are around what are the just a, you can say a revision, perhaps many of you already know this, but just a revision of what are the challenges and unmet needs in mental health care in particular, and then a brief orientation to what mind-body medicine is and how it can be of good help uh, to meet with some of these unmet needs. And what is the evidence base for mind-body medicine? Again, a very brief overview. And what is the contribution since its formation, the Mind-Body Medicine Task Force of Indian Psychiatric Society and what is the roadmap, which hopefully will connect us more and more with all of you. All the recent epidemiological studies, they highlight actually these three points. First one is a very large prevalence of mental health issues, which further seems to have got escalated after the COVID. And it is not just the COVID, you know, but the famous three Cs, the climate change, the impact of COVID, as well as the impact of conflicts, you know, the ongoing armed conflicts, wars. So these three Cs, they seem to be really driving hard the prevalence of mental health issues. And it's all over. Everybody knows now that mental health issues are very prevalent in the society. Uh, second point is a disturbing trend of rising incidents lifestyle and mental health issues in the young people. This is very disturbing, you know, because up till now the focus was on the older people. And now we know that uh, a, a large contribution to this prevalence is actually coming from young people. And it's not just the mental health issues, but even the lifestyle issues, which is adding to the overall burden of diseases. Then of course the changing demographics. And even if we talk about India, which is supposed to be a young nation, there is gradually an increase in the population of the aged. We know that senior citizens, the number of senior citizens is growing at alarming pace, although the, although the proportion may be small, but the absolute numbers, they themselves are quite kind of large because of our large population. So whether it is the young people, the older people, or the adults, everywhere we see that uh, there are challenges and these challenges are likely to escalate by the day. Uh, just yesterday, I had opportunity to record a presentation for an international conference on uh, psychotherapy and trauma, and uh, 
for that i had reviewed this domain uh, this whole business of early life stress early life adversity adverse childhood experiences all sort of trauma of deprivation and threat you know which leaves a biological scar on people now there is very well established medical science that it has long term health consequences so the childhood adversity doesn't end there but it has possibly lifelong consequences not just for the psychological health but a whole of host of uh, uh, health disorders so we have to keep this point in mind that uh, this uh, trauma which is also driving this prevalence and uh, uh, the second challenge is a challenge of comorbidity uh, again the epidemiology tells us that there is a large overlap of the psychiatric disorders people who suffer from psychiatric problems psychiatric disorders uh, they also have a more prevalence of various non communicable diseases you know cardio metabolic disorders diabetes obesity heart disease hypertension etc so it's like a double problem not only having the psychiatric disorder but having the medical disorder as well and this association has deep roots you know there is a shared even genetics also in behind this association so it is as if actually there is a basic common pathology manifesting in two different forms in the psychological form and also in the physical form we also know that lot of psychiatric medication also increase further increase this risk and the recent data shows that the overlap extends even to infective conditions like tuberculosis so if the mental health is not good uh, in when the infect person is susceptible even to get infective diseases all of you perhaps may be aware that uh, this paper was published as an editorial in the british journal of psychiatry few years ago and the title itself it suggests that uh, there is a physical health disparities and mental illness the scandal of premature mortality and what this paper demonstrated that psychiatric patients they suffer as i just mentioned from a host of these medical disorders and which actually reduce the life expectancy in psychiatric disorders because of these medical conditions and not just only because of suicides and other psychiatric related problems uh, so there is a harvard review here which uh, explains that how the various factors the stress and the environment and the genetic predisposition and the psychopathology the medicines how everything comes together and becomes causative for all these various disorders so in other words the problems are not just limited uh, for the psychiatrist alone you know but uh, they spill over onto the overall physical health of the individual a third challenge is a increasingly recognized role of stress in causation of the physical disorders you know so again not just causation of psychological disorders but in impacting the physical health and as we know the population health people the public health people they refer to the causes of causes you know so the inequalities the poverty and the causes like the three c's that i mentioned they basically drive a lot of stress and the stress finally results into disorders not only psychological but physical health cause and there has been a lot of very elegant laboratory and epidemiologic research which has very firmly established now you know that there is a connection between the mind health and physical morbidity so stress can stress is in fact a major driver of the cardiovascular disease and on the other hand the good news is that mind positive psychology can also have a protective role on the overall health or even the physical health and this highlights the need to orient the entire health profession not just psychiatry you know about the significance or importance of mind issues then if we come on the service delivery side we have these issues very well known to all of us we some we face the uh, dearth of manpower we don't simply have every day you read it in the media that uh, how well over and particularly in india how we have a dearth of manpower developing manpower we know is a long and tedious process in mental health care you know developing a psychiatrist developing a psychologist developing a psychiatric social worker it all takes time it all needs a lot of training so we have a dearth of manpower and of course stigma associated with the uh, mental health disorders doesn't seem to become less despite all the technological and other social advancement 
and uh, it basically results into large gap in access to care to large segments of population. So these are all the very well known issues. And therefore, if we put all these things together, you know, that we are faced with a situation of high prevalence, high comorbidity, physical comorbidity, then the stress translating itself in the form of physical morbidity and the gap of availability of care, that brings us actually to this point that uh, can mind-body medicine, uh, amongst other things, be helpful to fill this gap in caring for this unmet need. So it definitely emerges as a attractive candidate. Uh, you may perhaps know that uh, this whole idea, this whole concept, this whole approach called mind-body medicine, it was researched and popularized not really by the psychiatrist or the psychology people, but the Harvard physician and cardiologist Benson. And it is nearly now five decades, you know, that uh, this whole research happened in the Harvard and uh, wherein it was demonstrated that how stress has an effect on the physiology and how that uh, uh, physiological effect of stress can actually be reversed by some of these techniques. And over the years, uh, they have generated the Harvard group as well as several other groups world over. They have generated a lot of clinical and experimental evidence. And based upon this evidence, mind-body medicine, it has emerged as a strong, I would say, non-pharmac companion to mainstream medicine. So it's not an alternative medicine. It's a very much a part of the non uh, of the mainstream uh, medicine and wherein it plays an additive role to enhance the action of our interventions. And of course, there is good evidence to show that improves the outcomes, improves the quality of life across the illness life cycle, you know, so which means from prevention to dealing with the disorder in its active state to actually the process of rehabilitation. So at multiple points in the entire life cycle of any disorder, it is of help. Moreover, it is of help also to build resilience, you know, which is an ability to prevent getting us into the illness situation. What does it really consist of? So mind-body medicine derives its techniques basically from three sources. One source is, of course, the psychology and out of the psychology, particularly the new positive psychology. As you know, uh, this new positive psychology emphasizes rather than the psychopathology, it tries to actually make use of the resources or the assets that the individual may possess in a latent form. You know, so the positive psychological experiences, the optimism, the satisfaction with life, the meaningfulness to life, meaningfulness in life. These are all the factors which positive psychology tries to sort of encash upon. That is one source. Then yoga and meditation, which have been the traditional uh, uh, techniques into many uh, societies, uh, particularly the Indian society has a very strong tradition of uh, yoga and meditation coming from uh, diverse, uh, uh, you can say, sources, as well as the third component is very well researched health behavior practices, you know, which is the exercise and nutrition. So it's, it tries to combine uh, various uh, techniques from uh, these fields, psychology, yoga, meditation, as well as the health behavior practices. And what are its strengths? So uh, it has an ease of training and practice. You know? So compared to, if you compare, say, the training that uh, a person needs to have to really become a good psychotherapist is a fairly like a long training. And compared to that, mind-body medicine uh, training is uh, easier uh, for the trainers and also the practice is easier for the patients and the relatives. And therefore, possibly applicable to the bottom of the pyramid or the large number of people who may not really need very, very highly specialized kind of a psychological intervention. So there is ease of training and practice. There is a cultural acceptance element of cultural acceptance is also there with regards to uh, various uh, these techniques. And the patients and families, they get an active role in uh, all this uh, mind-body medicine uh, learning because it's at the end of the day, it's uh, about learning self-care. And last but not the least, it offers an opportunity for scale up. Scale up means that more people possibly can be trained with greater ease and including even the use of digital uh, platform. So people can be trained and the services can possibly be uh, expanded to larger number of patients than is possible in one-on-one -on -one type of situations. 
over the years mind body medicine has a uh, established application or established evidence in these uh, several disorders it's a busy slide uh, you don't need to really read all these diagnostic categories but suffice to say that uh, it has been shown to be useful in most of the uh, non communicable and uh, chronic disorder situations uh, just for the sake of uh, uh, students who may be attending uh, this presentation let me give a very quick recap of uh, this mind body split and reunion Although we have been uh, talking about uh, World Health Organization definition for a long time, which emphasizes that uh, health has multiple dimensions, you know, not just the physical dimension, but the social dimension, the psychological dimension, and even the spiritual dimension. But in practice, all of us know that uh, uh, our medical practice has been siloed and uh, basically divided between the physical health specialties and the mind health. And this unfortunate split. Sometimes it is attributed to this uh, French mathematician Descartes. It is said that Descartes united uh, algebra and geometry, but uh, because of his uh, opinion that uh, mind couldn't be a matter of subject matter of scientific uh, investigation at that time, uh, there was a split in uh, the science which uh, investigated uh, the health at that point of time. And the legacy continued for a long time. In fact, it does continue even today which prompted us to bring forth uh, this uh, task force. Uh, to give you a brief idea that how we came back actually to make this union, you know, because the divorce was quick, divorces can always be quick. Reunion always takes time. So it's a very interesting study which was published nearly three decades ago in New England Journal of Medicine, wherein people were actually exposed, volunteers were actually exposed to common cold virus. And very interestingly, it was found that not everybody developed the common cold, not everybody got the clinical common cold, but only the people, those who had high psychological stress, they developed the infection and the symptoms of uh, common cold. So emphasize the point that it is not just the virus, but it is the host. So if the host immunity is low, then the person catches the infection and psychological factors are very important trigger to uh, cause this low host immunity. And of course, in last 100 years, there have been several laboratory experiments, autonomic nervous system, cortisol, hypothalamic pituitary axis, psychoimmunology, psychoneuroimmunology, the brain plasticity, as well as a lot of clinical research milestones also, you know, which demonstrated that how psychology impacts the heart attacks and how particular people, particular type of personality people are more prone to get cardiovascular problem and now it is very conclusively, you can say, established through many meta-analysis that depression, anxiety, anger, and hostility, they are independent risk factor for illnesses, not just psychiatric illnesses, for all the major physical illnesses of modern times also. So mind has a very, very significant, very important place. And on the other hand, positive psychological well-being is protective. So if you have a sort of a negative state of mind, it is a risk. And if you have a positive state of mind, it is a protection. And this is the, in other words, is the basis on which this whole idea of mind-body medicine tries to work. So mind-body medicine, uh, uh, if, if I had to add something more interesting actually to this whole list are also the new type of studies which are showing that how some brain areas which were initially supposed to be researched a great deal by the psychiatry and neurology people with the assumption that they are active in anxiety and emotions and negative emotions, they actually are also responsible for fat deposition in body and for the causing the cardiovascular diseases. So new type of uh, evidence keeps coming every day and this whole body of research finally has been summarized in the form of what is called as psychoneuroimmune endocrinology, you know, to signify that all these systems are very well integrated, very well connected they have a bi-directional relationship you know so mind is very well connected with the brain the autonomic nervous system the hormones and the immune system and disturbance in any of this compartment has the effect on the other so if a person has a physical health issue the physical health issue spills over onto the mind and if a person has a mind issue that invariably spills over onto the body you know so there is no longer a compartment between the mind issues remaining separate and the body issues remaining separate, but they all happen together. And in fact, mind is one of the 
major drivers you know like we studied in pathology that how infections trauma tumor and uh, uh, some other factors nutritional deficiencies etc we are responsible for causing uh, disorders but now we know that mind issues is perhaps the one that tops the list most important i spoke about the positive psychology as a inspiration or as a source of for the techniques from the for the mind body medicine and uh, here in just extension what i spoke a minute ago that uh, a correlation between the negative emotions and the illnesses and on the other hand the positive psychology positive psychology has, uh, has traditionally been uh, discussed in the form of two dimensions there is one dimension called as a hedonic dimension which implies the happiness pleasure satisfaction that we have in life on our day to day basis as well as overall in life and the other dimension is called as a u dimensional dimension you know which talks about meaningfulness in life and one of the early if you may recall one of the early descriptions is actually found in victor frankl's book man's search for meaning you know as we know that uh, victor frankl uh, was a prisoner in the concentration camp victor frankl professor of neurology and psychiatry was a concentration camp prisoner in the second world war he survived that uh, concentration camp and he wrote a wonderful book his personal experience of being in that uh, and surviving that concentration camp and uh, which in autobiographic form he put in this small wonderful book called as man search for meaning and which later became the basis for his logotherapy so we know that both these hedonic factors as well as the eudaimonic factors the optimism they are all very important aspects and protective factors and they are the ones which need to be and every individual and to our own surprise you know that uh, for a very long time uh, i personally myself was ignorant of these and uh, luckily because of my long association with the clinical trials in which the medicines were being uh, administered to people and we had some patients who were with us for a very long time and then we thought that uh, we had known them really well let us stand see and to my surprise even a lot of patients who are quite uh, chronic who were quite chronic patients they also had a great ability actually you know to respond to the positive psychological activities so the whole idea is uh, basically a generation of I, re I request everybody else to please Sometimes mute yourself. That, uh, it may not be possible to complete a task, but you can extend up to five years. According uh, Nirmala, to that, Nirmala, please mute yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. So the whole idea is uh, basically generating the positive mind states willfully, and uh, there are many techniques. And I was, as I was just narrating my personal experience, you know, when there was a little bit of a disruption, that we found that even the very chronic patients also, you know, those who I was suffering for a long time, and uh, they were also quite responsive actually to positive psychology. So they still have a lot of uh, optimism and uh, interest left within them, unlike the popular belief that uh, chronic patients perhaps are more withdrawn and less amenable actually to positive psychology even they are also amenable to this aspect and then what is the about the yoga and meditation so when we talk in terms of health applications of course we know that you know yoga and meditation they have their own philosophical spiritual objectives the so called soteriological objectives but here we are not talking about them we are talking about the more practical from the viewpoint of view the objectives and uh, there are in that sense there are some specific goals you know which these techniques offer us so one important goal of course is the attention control and balancing the brain networks you know we know that underneath the various brain disorders is basically a dysregulation or imbalance in the various brain networks and one and they one way to sort of uh, repair gradually repair actually this particular problem is to regulate the traffic in the mind so that it starts with basically being aware of inner states also being referred to as mindfulness and after we are aware of, of the content of our mind we are a bit more mindful then next is developing our ability to regulate the content of the mind you know the controlling the thoughts and emotions as it happens actually through the practice so the practice of yoga and meditation to a great extent is about this attention regulation cognitive regulation and balancing these brain networks which also lead to emotional uh, sort of a balancing also and uh, 
comfort generation which is generated in the context of uh, these techniques but it's not only limited actually to the regulation of the mind states but it expands also to the regulation of the bodily states also uh, a little while ago i mentioned about the pni the psycho neuroimmune endocrine uh, network and part of the nervous network is the brain as well as this autonomic nervous system all of you know that autonomic nervous system connects the brain with all our internal organs you know our heart our lungs our digestive system and is really responsible for regulating the metabolism and uh, the stress response system and so one of the objectives of, of yoga and meditation also to bring in autonomic control the idea behind calling this once upon a time in olden times in physiology was that it was thought that this system is not under voluntary control you know but it has been demonstrated now that uh, this system is very much under voluntary control and if we could bring in autonomic regulation autonomic nervous system is implicated you know as a common system in many of these disorders then there is a beneficial effect here is a summary of the various neurobiological mechanisms yoga many of these studies were made in nemans also and uh, also many groups worldwide they are quite now active first is regulation of balance in the brain networks second is a neuroplastic or neuroprotective effect neuroplastic means that uh, brain has a lot of plasticity it can still change in adulthood it can still change irrespective of the presence of disorder and uh, to activate this activity and attain a uh, you can say a repair of the uh, problems in the structure which are there then enhancement of certain beneficial neurotransmitters and chemicals like gaba bdnf bdnf is like a brain uh, is like a brain fertilizer which helps grow the brain networks and which leads to the neuroplastic effect then the regulation of this stress responsive hormone cortisol as well as the hypothalamus pituitary axis which is involved in the stress mechanism then the limbic system and amygdala we know that they are involved in the stress and negative emotional states they are deactivation so the negative states become less and finally the autonomic nervous system modulation so these are the various neurobiological mechanisms of yoga and also elegant studies which demonstrate that how it can even have a protective effect you know so people those who are practicing these techniques how the loss of brain matter can actually be prevented in these individuals through practice of these this is from our own as i mentioned that uh, nimans has been involved in some of these uh, neurochemistry neurohormonal and neuroimaging studies and uh, my association professor ajit bide mentioned with our german colleagues the indo german collaboration on neuroscience of yoga we basically studied over the years modulation of autonomic nervous system and uh, uh, several experiments in last uh, decade or so in so which involved yoga in experienced practitioners yoga in people who are learning it uh, beginners who are learning it its comparison with the physical exercise so variety of things you know which led us to the conclusion that uh, uh, yoga is a strong uh, modulator of the autonomic nervous system and uh, in fact the different yogasans the practice of yogasans can produce different kind of autonomic modulation effect and over a period of time this is in the beginners that how if they continue their practice there is a development of the autonomic modulation which takes it in the more positive form this is the basis for resilience development you can say and of course many other type of studies the eeg studies the emg studies studying these uh, various aspects and which has also been helpful to Uh, contribute to this generation of evidence if i talk about meditation all of you know that uh, many of these effects have been demonstrated in fact a lot of this research actually started with studies on meditation vipassana meditation also called as a mindful meditation and recently interesting data that uh, it's not just the brain biology and the gross system biology but the meditation even has a effect at a molecular level so it regulates the genes responsible for the stress response you know so the harmful stress response and the upregulation of genes which are associated with the positive response so the effect literally seeps down to the genetic level so it's not only into the gross systems but goes down up to the dna level professor gangadhar this year uh, had the dlan rao murthy oration in our recently concluded national conference and uh, wherein in his presentation he had uh, uh, made this point that uh, 
how the meta analysis, various meta analysis, they support the clinical efficacy of yoga. So, either as an add on or as a monotherapy in variety of uh, psychiatric disorders and, of course, the physical disorders also, as we know. And this has led actually to recent inclusion of yoga in several international guidelines, you know, like the CanMed, the Canadian guideline, the NICE, the UK guideline, uh, yoga as an add on intervention for psychosis. And we particularly know its utility to manage the negative symptoms, you know, which have been not only very resistant actually to pharmacological intervention, but which is the main cause of burden of care in schizophrenia, you know, the negative symptoms. So uh, finally, we have something, some ray of hope for all these very chronic patients also, you know, as I mentioned about positive psychology, same holds here for uh, the aspects also. Then if I quickly, just in next two or three minutes before I conclude, if I have to talk about uh, the common health behavior practices, this is also very interesting, you know, the third part. So the positive psychology, yoga meditation, and the health behavior part. And uh, but this is something very interesting quote here, you know, that uh, little or no mention of exercise as a treatment option in standard mental health books, in spite of many studies advocating positive effects of exercise on mental health. You know, so mental health somewhere also got in the trap of, uh, uh, for a mind problem, very mind oriented treatment, you know, in this trap. And we forgot even to employ uh, the great benefits of something as simple as simple exercise, you know, simple walking, other forms of exercise, which possibly every patient can be engaged into. There is a good evidence about exercise in anxiety disorders, exercise in depression, and even exercise in schizophrenia, you know, just to highlight this aspect that how exercise can also be of a great help into all these individuals. You know, these are some of the forgotten, you can say modalities, simple things, which we unfortunately forgot to implement in our patients. If we talk about uh, practical aspects that how do we implement all this in our clinical practice, you know, so the idea is a stepped care approach. Stepped care approach basically implies in, if I had to give you a general example that 80% of our patients are relatively straightforward, simple cases likely to respond better and faster. You know, so the idea is that at least all these people can get the mind-body medicine approach. You know, so starting with attention to mind-body and health behavior assessment. So we need to, our assessment possibly need to be more comprehensive, you know, not just the mental state examination, but also paying attention to the person's physical health and the health behavior. And the basic counseling, you know, basic as I just now, as I said, a counseling about regular exercise, following a proper nutrition and engaging into some kind of a positive activities, you know, some kind of a behavioral activation by self. This could very well be a part of a very routine clinical consultation that we do. Demands really no extra special time or extra special sessions. Starting with that, the next step could be to schedule dedicated MBM therapy or uh, training sessions. Either we do it ourselves or we also have colleagues who are able to do that for us, you know, who have a training in this, to creating kind of a multi-session MBM programs. Uh, people like the Harvard University, those who have been pioneer in this domain, they now have such programs, you know, which they offer 12-session programs, 16-session programs, wherein they take in the people and they train them into the patients and then they train them into these programs in a very structured way. And we found that conducting workshop is a possibly a very economical kind of a time economical activity for everybody, you know, because you can have a group of easily 30, 35 people and in a, a single day workshop, also you are able to give them a reasonable orientation for them able to do a home-based practice. So in a nutshell, our contribution to the Indian Psychiatric Society and some of these activities which we try to do, we thought that uh, basically training is most important. Uh, training would uh, bring the necessary skill to all the people who are interested to implement it part of their clinical work. And we have been organizing workshops and symposia. And uh, this is one of the uh, one of the symposia, international symposia in which we were also partners. And uh, Professor Bide, you are very kind to show a photograph, my photograph, a group photograph with Norman Sartorius dating back to uh, 20, sorry, 1994, dating back to 1994. So move forward and here in 2019, we are back with Norman Sartorius, you know, wherein now Norman Sartorius 
has this uh, new mission to gap this uh, uh, comorbidity. You know, so his now new mantra is the three C's, address the comorbidity. We were never trained as medical people to address the comorbidity. So uh, learn to manage the comorbidity, collaborate and build the capacity. You know, so the three C's for that. So this was the one of such uh, affairs. And of course, uh, this was the inaugural first workshop. You can see Ajit Bide standing next to Mohan Agashe in this photograph. And uh, he has been a really great strength of pillar for us within the Indian Psychiatric Society. So you see Professor M.S. Valiathan, Professor Gangadhar, T.S. Rao, Mohan Agashe, and Ajit Bide. And the occasion of uh, this, our first inaugural two-day training workshop. Subsequently, we also made a workshop. I referred that mind-body medicine is also useful for resilience building. So last year, we made a workshop in collaboration with Nimans about the resilience training. And basically, the course was for residents. You know, we thought that resident doctors themselves should get these inputs so that uh, they emerge as uh, people, those who have a better ability to handle their own professional uh, responsibilities in the times to come. And then we have also been uh, trying to collaborate and take this movement forward to other medical associations, you know, to bridge this gap of comorbidity and uh, to collaborate and to build the capacity and effectively to build the social capital in the words of Professor Norman Sartorius. We tried to make friends in other associations and uh, you can see in this photograph also, uh, Dr. Ajit Bide, this was uh, with the Indocrine Society of India the people, the specialist in endocrinology and diabetes, their national association. And we made the first collaborative conference with them in 2020. And it continues till date, you know, despite the COVID, the next edition also happened and uh, it will sort of uh, continue. So this is the, uh, in short, our, uh, our activities within the Indian Psychiatric Society. And uh, of course, we have also been trying to make the workshop for the patients and families. I already mentioned that, and we had a great uh, success experience that are very time economical, people could be trained. So the professionals could be trained and the patients and relatives can also be trained. And uh, therefore, mental health people really need to consider this seriously that uh, they need to uh, sort of offer themselves to be the leaders of this MBM, you know, they are to our mind, natural leader of mind body medicine. They are the ones, at least in the Indian context, to possess the maximum domain expertise about the mind issues. And we already said that, you know, mind perhaps tops the list of all the etiologic factors amongst the various pathologies. So it is time that uh, what was driven initially by the physicians and the cardiologists, that uh, at least in the Indian context, all the people, the mental health professionals, you know, all those people who identify themselves as mental health professionals, first is that they make an effort to train themselves and then they take the responsibility onto themselves also to train the other health professionals as well as sensitize society about uh, this very important aspect. And let me conclude by saying that uh, we said that we have a lot of challenges. So mind-body approach, it possibly can open opportunity to improve the outcomes in all these situations, psychiatric and medical conditions. And uh, it could also possibly be cost-effective, you know, as we discussed to implement it in the Indian context, we need to seriously look at that, something uh, which can be trained, people can be trained in a shorter time, can be delivered through the digital medium also, and therefore possibly quite effective for us. And it would also, uh, to some extent, to my mind, I said in the beginning that uh, Professor Murthy and uh, Professor uh, uh, Mohan Isaac, who were my teachers in psychiatry, and uh, they tried to uh, bring mental health into the public health fold. And one of the ideas was that the mind health should go down actually to the primary care physician. So this could be, uh, I think, think our vehicle, the mind-body medicine could be our vehicle to attain that and to improve the reach, to reduce the stigma. And last but not the least, we have to be also be mindful of our personal well-being. Luckily enough, this being a non-pharmacological intervention, it is something which we can try on ourselves also. You know, So there is positively no harm in it. So we need to have some degree of openness and uh, we need to try it for our own personal well-being also. And if something works for us, there is a good probability that it will also work for our patients and their families. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for a very, uh, painting a very vast canvas. You have brought in almost every aspect that could um, relate to the field of psychosomatic medicine. Of course, nobody uses the term psychosomatic medicine. I think jargon has to keep changing. And today we will speak about mind-body medicine. In this country, you are one of the pioneers in this field. The pioneer, I should say, as far as the Indian Psychiatric Society is concerned, definitely. Uh, it was very interesting that this uh, field came about through the... Uh, uh, work of uh, a physician in Harvard University. You mentioned Dr. Benson's work. It is also interesting to recall that one of the techniques he used for uh, treating anxiety, again, a non-pharmacological treatment is Jacobson's progressive muscle relaxation. Yes. And Jacobson, again, was a physician. He was not a psychiatrist or psychologist at all. And uh, many people are not quite aware of that. Uh, you emphasized quite rightly lifestyle modification uh, for better mental health. Could you elaborate on that a little as a practitioner of mind-body medicine? Yes, sir. So I think, you know, this issue of uh, lifestyle uh, uh, basically became prominent. You know, I would say after I also became sensitized to this comorbidity aspect. We know that uh, particularly after the introduction of a medicine called olanzapine, you know, there has been a spurt in obesity in our patients, you know, people, those who received, of course, it happens with many other medicines also, you know, it happens with other mood stabilizers also. So on one hand, we were observing this phenomena, you know, I would say that, uh, so it, it was almost becoming something like this, that you are able to control certain symptoms, but that seems to be happening at the cost of something else. So it is as if that you are trying to fix the mind health at the cost of the body health of the individual. So can there actually be a balance between the two? You know, can there be a situation wherein uh, there is optimum treatment for the mental condition, but at the same time, the patient doesn't have the ill effects of the weight gain and the later on the consequences of that weight gain in the form of diabetes and hypertension. As I mentioned that uh, in these clinical trials, in some of them, we luckily had a close follow-up of many of patients, you know, over 10 years, 15 years. And we actually saw it in our patients, you know, that they developed diabetes, that they put on weight, they developed hypertension, they developed abnormalities into their ECG, you know, QT prolongation and all these things. So it's not just that it happens in the research papers, you know, it also happens in the reality. And that has been a sensitization and therefore this particular aspect that why can't, you know, lifestyle modification, which if you go to a physician, if you go to a diabetologist, there is a high emphasis on it. You know, the first thing that the diabetologist does is to measure your weight and to measure your body mass index and your hip and waist ratio and so on and so forth. So why can't actually a psychiatrist do the same thing? You know, why can't a psychiatric office measure the patient's blood pressure? Why can't we measure a BMI? Why can't we advise people about, we can't sensitize them, you know, that the, this medication and the disease process. We know stress also accelerates obesity. Medicines accelerate obesity. So if we know that, why can't actually the lifestyle measures be implemented from the beginning, you know, that you administer the medicine to people, but to also caution them about observing the diet and uh, kind of engaging themselves with regular exercise, which anyway is beneficial in turn, not only from the viewpoint of physical health, but also for the mind health. So that is the sort of a beginning, I would say, you know, of this simple lifestyle intervention. It very, simply very, starts with these measures, I would say. Very appealing. A sensitization, an orientation, you know, to the patient and to the relatives. And uh, once, and the best part I realized in India, the possibility that uh, we are not addressing only the patient, you know, in addition to the patient, invariably it is the relative and in turn the family, they possibly all get sensitized to these aspects. They all possibly are, have a ability to walk together to eat more nutritious food and uh, on our end we also then have the caution that we anyway observe in clinical okay. trials you know to really adhere to the evidence-based interventions to keep the dosage small and to try and bring in as many add-on interventions as possible you know, with the hope that the dosages kept, can be kept small to avoid the impact on negative impact on the lifestyle Right. I, I request members of our audience, you could raise your hand. Uh, there, there is a uh, place for you to record your reaction. If you raise your hand, uh, we could have you ask your questions. In the meanwhile, 
Uh, thank you for covering this bit about lifestyle. I, my next question for you, uh, Sanjay, is uh, adverse childhood experience. Yes. As a, as a uh, continuous student of the phenomenon of child abuse, and my focal interest is in emotional yes. abuse particularly, uh, how does this affect physical health? We know for sure that uh, adverse childhood experience probably reflects in the personality, it reflects in mental illness. What about uh, the physical health? Is, is there, what evidence do we have? There is in fact a very strong evidence, sir, that uh, the uh, brain structure, the brain connectivity, and then the brain areas which actually regulate the entire bodily functions, the physical health. You know, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, the entire immune system, and the hormonal system, which involves multiple hormones, not just the stress response, you cortisol hormone, and uh, even the autonomic nervous system. So the entire PNI is actually involved in the child sex abuse. So whenever there is a child sexual abuse, or in fact, a very elegant study is now about the stress of deprivation versus the threat. You know, so deprivation typically implies physical nourishment or psychological. Uh, nourishment, uh, dearth of that. And a threat typically implies actually the sexual abuse, violence, physical abuse. So the sexual abuse, physical abuse, violence, it tremendously impacts actually the brain as well as the whole entire body. In fact, the evidence suggests that uh, either there is a failure to thrive, you know, so there are studies also which are now shown that how the there could be a growth stunting and a permanent scar, biological embedding. You know, people have also done epigenetic studies and even the studies with regards to the telomere biology. You know, so they have shown that how the changes in the telomere biology and the epigenetic changes. So the biological scar becomes permanent. You know, they use a term called as a biological embedding. That how actually the early childhood trauma is biologically embedded in the system and programs the individual you know, for development of later life disorders. In fact, it is estimated that a large proportion, perhaps, you know, one third of all adulthood disorders could actually be outcome of the trauma that they face as children. So one more, one more reason to beat up our parents and say that you caused it all. Yes. <laughs> Just in a lighter way. I know the emphasis tends to be very lightly on sexual abuse. And in the last two decades, we have turned our attention quite a lot to sexual abuse. Yeah. Much more difficult to define anyway is the... Uh, field of emotional abuse. Uh, you mentioned. Can I can I yeah, can please. I just add one more very yeah, interesting actually finding? Sure. Uh, people did some uh, brain imaging. You know the functional MRIs and the volume MRIs with uh, these children, and what they found is that uh, there is a correlation between the type of trauma and the reduction in the brain area, that particular brain area. So if a child suffers sexual trauma. There is a reduction in the brain volume, you know, which relates actually to the perception of genitalia in the brain, the somatosensory area. If there is an emotional abuse, some other brain areas, you know, which subserve actually the self appraisal as well as the emotional appraisal, they are stunted. So there is a stunting, in fact, of a specific brain areas as part of these different forms of abuse and deprivation. And possibly they may possibly produce, you know, psychiatry, I think, uh, hasn't yet. Uh, possibly linked, you know, adulthood psychiatry hasn't linked itself to that. But those authors, they comment and all this is very recent research. You know, it's just happening in the last four or five years that they have said that a specific type of uh, psychopathology can happen out of these brain changes in adulthood. And they talk about uh, uh, some kind of a shielding phenomena, you know, which was possibly you as a psychotherapist would say uh, something like a repression. The initial purpose the initial biological purpose is to shield the child. You know, if abuse is happening of a particular type, the brain growth in that area is like, you know, stunted. So the person doesn't feel more pain of that abuse. So in the short term, possibly it's a survival mechanism and a good possibility to survive, to repress, you know, that particular type of abuse, but in longer term. So some short term pain, short term advantage, and then a lifelong disadvantage. Right. So, so very interesting kind of a research, neurobiology research. Personally, I will be very happy to actually share with uh, anybody who has a uh, interest into that. In fact, I can ask actually the organizers of that uh, other event to even share the whole entire presentation itself. So right. very interesting one. Okay. It was the, a great the, addition to my own knowledge also, you know, that how the 
childhood adversity itself sows the seed for a lot of adulthood issues and if that that's why when i connect it with this data which alarms us that the increasing problems lifestyle problems and the psychiatric psychological issues in the young people is possibly a very alarming thing for us to, in the times to come the tragedy of emotional abuse is that emotional abuse al almost always accompanies all other forms of abuse so it's yes. physical abuse sexual yes. abuse and yes. emotional abuse in isolation now uh, you spoke about positive mental health yes sir. and i find that uh, this term is bandied about quite a lot especially recently uh, and uh, i think ever since seligman was a president of the indian yes. sorry american psychological association and he gave a great emphasis yes. to the notion of positive mental health in practical terms people who have had a lot of adversity attending on their lives in this country there are lots of them poverty is not the smallest cause of adversity yes how do we get them to be oriented to be positive in their mental health any any uh, quick tips or uh, suggestions yeah yeah see what i personally do as well as our experience actually in these uh, workshops you know that we made with uh, people and uh, the patients and uh, their families and it had actually people from uh, different uh, socio economic groups you know not just the uh, relatively well to do people but the uh, people from the impoverished also so it is actually you know positive psychology to my mind is actually about the aspirations that people hold you know we all the time nowadays talk about aspirational society you know so at an individual level everyone has aspiration irrespective whether they are well or unwell so it is basically fulfillment of those aspirations you know somewhere olden times it was also talked as about as actualization you know so it is the aspirations that uh, which people possess and if they find the avenues sometimes what happens is that sometimes uh, they are unable to find the proper avenues you know for fulfillment of their aspirations and a very common sense i i wouldn't say that it needs to be a you know a great training in uh, psychotherapy but some life experience anybody who has a reasonable life experience possibly can come in to solve this problem you know that they have an aspiration and if they are unable to actualize it what ways may be there to sort of give it a better expression and that, that is the best thing you know people have like i said that even i was quite surprised to see myself you know that even chronic schizophrenics those who have been unwell for several years even they have these aspirations you know unfortunately the psychiatry has been so seeped into tapping into the psychopathology that we rarely ask people you know about their aspirations or the positive sides of their life or the real life very true and the second component which is also in the context of the lifestyle that you asked you know i read about a very interesting research which people working with the uh, people working in ethology they do it's called as the activity budgeting you know people who work with the wild animals they try to study you know what time they spend into you know how they spend their typical day you know, so there are people who studied the stray dogs people who studied actually the other wild animals then how do they typically spend their day so this is also something very interesting you know we show a great deal of interest in other personal information but we rarely ask our patients you know that how do they spend the typical day what do they exactly do you know that and where where there is a scope for them to do something which will bring them some positive experience and some joy you know at the end of the day it's a success experience positive psychology boils down to having success experience you know so so to counter actually the failures which they experience and I, that's why i realized that uh, it could be a i don't want to use the term called as a shortcut but certain kind of heuristics you know which people with even good experience life experience can also bring in a mature person can therefore bring in and that's why the hope that even the physicians interested physicians who possibly may not be trained to such a great depth you know and other health professionals who may not be trained to a great depth into the formal psychology can also possibly be good psychological coaches because if they look at people's daily activities their activity budget as well as their aspirations and try and help them you know to uh, get around the practical difficulties in giving that then that's it you know so we are not talking about you know really very big things in life but we are talking about the small happiness small pleasures in life you know which they get right so that was a very interesting part personally to me of this uh, association with this particular activity which opened my eyes you know beyond psychopathology right we have we have to broaden our horizon and look at uh, 
the uh, research that accrues to us from other fields. I'm very glad you brought up ethology in this context. Uh, finally, I want to ask you about exercise. I'm very glad you brought up this point of exercise. I am alarmed that not many psychiatrists even ask their patients whether they have an exercise schedule and that they ought to incorporate at least a half hour schedule every day. Light exercise to start with and perhaps aerobic yes. exercise is more beneficial than any other form of exercise. And that contributes a lot to uh, physical and of course, uh, physical of course, and also mental uh, well-being. We are so busy writing prescriptions and we are so busy uh, checking for side effects of uh, medication. We often forget the simple things in life which you have brought in yes. over here. For anybody from any form, with any form of uh, mental disorder, I think exercise is tremendously important. Thank you very much for emphasizing that point. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite your teachers, Professor Srinivas Murthy, sir, Dr. Arison, okay. if you could yeah. unmute him. Uh, yeah. I, I feel very conflicted in responding to this question, to comment on it. Because uh, let me be honest and say, the biggest challenge is getting the psychiatrist to think beyond psychiatric problems. You might say, why are you saying this? You know, March 2020, a, a position statement was made by the Indian Psychiatric Society about the COVID situation. I contributed most of it. One of the items that I said was about lifestyle, exercise, sleep, relaxation, togetherness, all evidence proving thing. Till today, the IPS has not touched it. I have raised it three times in the IPS meetings, including the last World Mental Health Day. And I've written about it in the Hindu. I've published it in the, uh, uh, the Tejpur uh, newsletter. I distributed extensively. I'm not saying it about myself. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Bide as well as Sanjay that exercise, sleep, relaxation, all of these things are non-pharmacological things which are evidence proven. Similarly, to handle distress, we have journaling, sharing of experiences, music, thinking differently, spirituality, which I talked about last time a lot. So I think the biggest problem is we psychiatrists are in the hands of the pharma industry. If you see the last few emails that came up, you will know what, what I'm talking about. The one person was saying, why can't we get something out of it when pharma is making money? I mean, have we reduced ourselves to this? I we personally have. feel very sad, extremely sad, to some extent angry that we have reduced ourselves as agents of the pharmaceutical industry. When there is so much, particularly in the Indian cultural context, just by coincidence, today, whole day, I was with a set of caregivers, a dozen caregivers, teaching them about self-care skills for emotional health at AMC. I just finished it at four o'clock and then joined the session. You know, So I have no doubt what uh, Sanjay has said is the direction in which we should go. Two books I would like to refer in this context, one by the former director of the NIMH, Thomas Insel, who wrote Healing from Mental Health to Mental Illness. Second is a book by Andrew Skull, which came out two weeks back where he, the title itself tells you what he's talking about, Discarded Med Remedies, a powerful book about the criticism about our profession. Leaving aside that, I personally think we need to do three things. First, we need to recognize the personhood of the person the same way Sanjay mentioned it. Secondly, we have to do a lot more research into these lifestyle issues so that they can be taken to the level of pharmacological intervention. Third thing is we must talk to our patients Give them this information. These are the things that you can do when you have depression, along with your antidepressant, go to Lalbagh or go to a park, talk about it, take care of your nutrition, take care of your relationship, take care of your spirituality. And I think in a country like India, where we have such a limited resources, the people should become the resources, then we don't have any shortage of things. So my conclusion is that the topic which Sanjay has talked about is fantastic. It's very important. But I wish we, the psychiatric society, would take it up seriously and address it. And there is a tremendous resistance in spite of my putting it in the position statement. You just go back and read the position statement. Number one is about lifestyle. Till today, we have not done a single thing about it. So I 
congratulate Sanjay for this and MPA for choosing this topic and hope we'll have better days in this area. Thank you very much. Well taken, thank sir. Thank you, for, thank you for making that point. And I will also try to get the IPS to wake up to your uh, call. <laughs> uh, may I now invite Dr. Mohan Isaac, uh, Sanjay's other teacher who is present today yeah. and who has been a sheet anchor in many, yeah. many ways to the revival of MPA, Sanjay, you may want to know. Uh, may I request Professor Mohan Isaac to say a few thank words? Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, I cannot uh, help, uh, I cannot agree more with Murthy, with whatever he has said. Uh, and uh, Ajit has already uh, assured us that he will use his good offices as the uh, past president, as a distinguished past president, uh, to set those things right with the Indian Psychiatric Society. Anyway, that's a problem with the psychiatric body, psychiatrists, Indian Psychiatric Society, etc. Coming back to uh, Sanjay's talk, thank you very much, Sanjay, uh, uh, for this wonderful talk. I, uh, only in the afternoon, I thought I must inform uh, many of our old Nimans guys that Sanjay is giving a talk for Medical Pastor Association. So I sent the poster to many people. Uh, many of them, because they are all in different parts of the world, uh, they may not have uh, logged into your talk. Because I will tell them that this will be recorded, it will be available if you do want to. But at least I've received a couple of messages uh, saying, oh, Sanjay was one year my junior, Sanjay was for two years my senior. <laughs> I must mention that two people who specifically mentioned is Dr. Nagesh Pai and okay. Dr. Rangara. Okay, this is okay. just for you to know. I mean, yes. this is because I did started with the, uh, you know, photograph of uh, Nimans and all that. Yes. So thank you very much, Sanjay, for telling us uh, about all these. Uh, the lesson for us in Medical Basel Association is we have, of course, tried to do some of these things, uh, you know, uh, as early as the 1980s, our then president, Air Commodore Chaco, he is no more, the late Air Commodore Chaco, uh, used to come and teach our residents yoga because he used to, he had learned uh, yoga from, I don't know, Bihar School of Yoga or so. I'm talking about the 80s. And in the committee, many people used to say, what is this old president coming and teaching uh, our persons who suffer from schizophrenia, yoga? So we are aware of it, but maybe these days we are, last two years it has been COVID and all that, and we have had staff shortage. But my appeal to all the staff who, are, uh, who have listened to uh, Sanjay's talk is simple things, exercise, nutrition, optimism, sense of well-being, a very important point which Sanjay mentioned. We think that people with the chronic schizophrenia, many of our uh, residents have that diagnosis, they have negative symptoms, but they also have aspirations. Only if you care to talk to them and if you care to listen to them. So this optimism, simple exercise every day, uh, well, we are all aware of this because they have in MPA badminton uh, trophies and this and we have the uh, you know, the rehabilitation version of the um, uh, 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 league cricket match and all that. But uh, Sanjay's talk uh, will reinforce some of this. And my uh, appeal to all our staff is please keep this in mind and let us, uh, 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 with a greater devotion, implement the practical aspects of the mind-body uh, medicine that Sanjay talked about. Once again, uh, thank you very much, Sanjay. It has been a great pleasure to see thank you and listen to Back to you, Ajit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Dr. If I can just come in for a minute, uh, yeah. Ajit. Yeah. The March issue of the Journal of American Medical Association Psychiatry has a meta-analysis about exercise and depression. Concludes exercise is a very important part of the treatment of depression. Those of you who are who, those who are skeptical can just go back and read it. It's freely downloadable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I think I think we have to really stop thinking of. Uh, pharma and start, start thinking of the people. I'm saying it because I see a tremendous deterioration in the last 50 years that I've been a psychiatrist. Thank you very much. I'll have something to say about that, Professor Murthy, in a little while. You can uh, remove your hand raised. Thank you, thank you for your remark. Uh, Lorna, would you like to say something? You'd have to unmute yourself first. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to respond to what Dr. Murthy was saying about pharma. 
Um, just to give you a, a little story from my experience, for those of you that don't know, I'm retired, but I was a mental health chaplain working in psychiatry. And when I was still working, I asked if I could join in a meeting. It was, it was a, a talk about depression that had been funded by a pharma company and it was intended only for doctors because they were hoping that the doctors would then sign up for their medicines. Um, the psychiatrist who said I could attend was very happy with that. I asked a question during that meeting and my question made the presenter realize that I was not a psychiatrist. And he asked that I be removed from that meeting because I should not have been there. <laughs> and the psychiatrist said to him, if you are not prepared to let a chaplain who wants to learn in this meeting, we will not use your drugs again and take them from you. Um, so I'm just saying that because I think change can happen, but it, it needs to be um, firmly done, <laughs> perhaps right. is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> That, that's very important. Thank you. As a chaplain, I know that you're, you're perhaps at the diametric opposite end of Parma, where we, we your, your realm is largely uh, in the in mental health, the spiritual one. And I think that that needs emphasis as uh, Sanjay also implicitly and explicitly included in his talk. Uh, I can't help re remembering uh, Isaac Mark's book on fears and phobias, where he mentions in the preface or the first chapter that he would get very little sponsorship because he was a great advocate at that time of behavior therapy. Cognitive behavior therapy had not yet come along. And he said, I get very few sponsors because I don't prescribe drugs for them. So th 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 that is the tragedy. I'm saying all this very tongue in cheek, Professor Murthy and Lorna and Mohan and Sanjay, because our program today is being helped by the micro labs, <laughs> which is a pharma company. But I will emphasize that they have sought nothing from us, no increased yes. prescription, no insistence yes. that NPA uh, patronize the, they, they, they are doing altruistic service and several people, several pharma companies do reach out to them. Everybody's experience is not like Lorna having to be shielded by another psychiatrist to be allowed to participate uh, in that particular uh, program. Uh, before I hand over, I, I would also like to recall Sanjay, please take this in the right spirit. Uh, the, the Gerard Kaplan, Professor Gerard Kaplan, was probably the first author to, uh, first person to write a book on preventive psychiatry. He had got his uh, draft together and he compiled it all, put it aside. And uh, his daughter, is, I think, uh, just entered college, had gone through the draft unknown to him. And in the morning, he looked for his draft and he couldn't find it. And she came in out of her bedroom and she flung the papers on her uh, on, on his desk and said, Oh, daddy, you people are always doing research into people, what people already know quite well. So I think <laughs> your talk was full of truths, many of which we have been aware of, but done very, very little about. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought these truths back home to us. Unfortunately, we live in a reductionist state and we don't believe anything unless there is molecular radiological proof. We have forgotten to look with the naked eye. We are relying too much on the microscope and the radiographs. I think there are lots of truths that I think I will cherish from your talk today, as I'm sure will uh, most of our, all of our audience today. Thank you. I must say that Sanjay took yeah. all of 30 seconds to yeah. accede to my request to come and give this talk. He said, if it's OMP and if you ask me, there's no way I would say no. So yeah, here he is. And thank you, Sanjay. I hope you will continue to associate with MPA in other ways. Absolutely, sir. Right. Absolutely. So much. once again, congratulations to MPA uh, on the Golden Jubilee. And uh, I hope that they you know, continue with uh, renewed vigor. They take this work forward and maybe uh, to my wish to Professor Mohan Isaac, you know, what you mentioned that MPA actually has been a sort of a pioneer and a champion completely unknown that when yoga was possibly unheard of, you know, in the mainstream psychiatry, even then you were implementing it. So why not actually, you know, make a MPA sort of a hub for really implementing on the ground, you know, mind-body medicine, some of these simple things, you know, simple ideas about the, what we call as the five pillars of health. In the end, it is about good sleep, good nutrition, good physical activity, and a good psychological engagement, and a little bit change in life, you know, variability. So 
at the end of the day, it is these basic five pillars. So I hope you know that Professor Isaac and uh, Professor Murthy and uh, Ajit Bide, you all take initiative, you know, as sort of our leaders to encourage this activity more and particularly its implementation on the ground. And of course, we will also try to research more, you know, about these uh, smaller aspects. Some of this seems to be easy research. So thank you so much. It has been a great privilege, I would say, to be on uh, this particular forum. So thank you so much, Professor Murthy, Professor Isaac. Professor Ajit Bide, yeah, Ajit sir. Uh, my only quarrel with your what you said just now is that not sort of pioneer. We are the pioneers. In, uh, yes. <laughs> NGO and mental health, we are the pioneer. No, no two ways about that. There was Thank nobody so doing this. Sorry for. No, 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 no. That. that was uh, merely pulling your leg. I hope you're feeling a little taller. <laughs> uh, right. I would like to introduce you to our president, uh, Dr. Joseph George, who is himself a professor of counseling. Uh, Dr. Joseph George is our uh, uh, president. Uh, our secretary is currently away. Uh, Mr. Samuel Mohan has uh, left the country just today to be with his family in the US for a short while. Uh, uh, Dipanjana, can you uh, become visible for a short while? She's our treasurer, uh, Dipanjana Das Basu. Uh, I guess she's otherwise engaged. Uh, Dr. Mohan Isaac, as I mentioned to you, is our uh, uh, former president for a long, uh, vice president for a long ten, time. That's when I joined MPA and then president for a very long time. And recently is the uh, reformer, revivalist of uh, uh, MPA. Uh, that, that's what, uh, Ms. Dipanjana, our treasurer. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Alphonse Kurian is our stand-in secretary as well as the chairman of our establishment committees. Alphonse, just say hi to Sanjay. Hi. Uh, our very, very modest MC today, who did not even introduce himself, is Bhaskar, very capable young man uh, who filled in to be the MC. Unfortunately, we are missing uh, Ellen, who is uh, uh, the chair of the Public Service uh, Committee of uh, uh, MPA. Uh, it's under the ages of the Public Service Committee and the Golden Jubilee Committee, headed by Dr. Mohan Isaac, that we had you over. Uh, back to you, Bhaskar, to take this forward. Bhaskar, Bhaskar just one minute. Yes, uh, I just want to say uh, something which I read uh, just now in the chat box. And this is from a very senior professor of psychology from Bangalore University, retired, and who is a columnist for general writing about, you know, mental health and psychology issues. Uh, she writes, excellent talk. As a psychologist, it was music to hear a psychiatrist speaking about these preventive measures. Thank you very much. You know, psychiatrists and psychologists always have this problem about medicines, no medicines, behavior therapy. Ajit and Dr. Murthy referred to. I just thought I will read it out. This is from Mandika Ghosh, uh, who participated in uh, the lecture and who's just uh, put it in the chat box. Back thank to you, you Master. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ajit, uh, thank you so much for conducting a very informative and, you know, a very engaging uh, Q&A session. And uh, Dr. Sanjay, uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing uh, a, a very, you know, a unique uh, topic to us because, you know, as a mental health professional, as Dr. Ajit mentioned, uh, we know about it, but uh, we don't know how to use it, you know, the way it has to be used. You know, that is something that we need to, like, uh, inculcate in our practice so that, you know, we can help uh, the people who are suffering with mental illness as much as possible. Uh, anyways, I, I would li like to uh, like move on to the next part of the program. Uh, I would uh, request uh, our president, Dr. Joseph George, to do the vote of thanks. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I am pleased that all of us are enriched by this afternoon presentation and discussion on Mind, Body, Medicine, and Mental Health by Dr. Sanjay Patke, the fourth lecture of Golden Jubilee series. And all of us are did have an excellent time um, this one and a half hour, I believe. And this was not possible unless, you know, there was, you know, number of people involved. First, I want to thank the MBA team who are seen today on the platform and not seen on the platform, and the team who did the 
you know, each series, the working committee, uh, think together what is the next topic. So this topic was decided. Then Dr. Ajit took the took, volunteered to contact Dr. Sanjay. That's why the, the, the chief guest and the person fixed. So first, I want to thank the NBA team. Then I want to thank Dr. Sanjay Patke for, for accepting our invitation and being present with us with a well-thought, researched presentation. Taking the resources from traditional uh, Indian meditation to to the to the to the most recent positive psychology and the positive psychology's emphasis. Yeah, doctor said very well. Do not look at uh, the illness, but look at the possibilities of health, which is an excellent. Excellent exhortation for all of us to take seriously and see the connection between mind, body, and medicine and positive mental health, which is which is something that we need to take forward, not only for MPA, but also for all of us wherever we practice. And uh, also I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mohan Isaac for uh, being present who is the chairperson of the Golden Jubilee Celebration and giving us the, um, the introduction as well as the, the opening the forum for the discussion today. And Dr. Ajit Bide, who is the vice president, who has been instrumental in getting our guest speaker today and who, has, who does always a lot of uh, background work, which he did. And I want to thank you, Dr. Ajit, also for moderating the session and that uh, extremely, um, you know, extremely thought, um, follow up questions and, uh, and the discussions. I want to thank Ellen Shinde, who, who logged in for five minutes and she again got back. She, she did have, do have family emergencies. So, she was not with us. She is the chairperson of the Academic and Publication Committee of MBA. And this program is organized by that committee. I want to thank her too. Baskar for being the, the MC this afternoon. Thank you very much. I also want to thank all the, the, the psychiatrists, doctors, counselors, and students who are present for this presentation. Thank you for joining. And this is my great responsibility for me to tell you. We are pleased with your presence and continued support, MBA. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, sir. You know, uh, thank you so much. Our president is very modest. You know, uh, sir didn't uh, say anything. But, sir, uh, I know that you have been supporting us uh, for conducting everything that, you know, we have been able to organize. Thank you so much for being uh, there and you know doing the right things at the right moment. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, before before we wind up uh, the program, I would just like to uh, uh, inform all of you that Medical Pastoral Association, as Dr. Mohan Isaac had mentioned, our website is under uh, like review, and we will be back uh, very shortly. But we are available on YouTube, we are available on Facebook and Instagram. So. Uh, you, you can just search Medico Pastoral Association. If we are available on these networks and uh, please uh, subscribe and follow and you will be getting all the updates regularly. So thank you so much for joining uh, this wonderful session. Uh, yes. Until we, uh, yes, sir, Dr. Yes, we, we must, in, in spite of, again, tongue in cheek, while we have, uh, Castigated the pharma industry broadly, that we must thank Microlabs for yes. being our sponsors. We somehow we forgot to mention them. Thank you for sponsoring and continuously supporting all our activities, expecting nothing in return except a small thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so um, until we meet for the next series, uh, um, have a good evening and uh, bye bye and take care. Thank you so much for attending. The thank you. Good day and bye, bye everybody. Good day. Sanjay, I'll take leave. All the best.
Thank you, sir. So I catch up with you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bhatke. Please join whenever you can in the next series too. Sure, sure, sure. We'll send you the invitation. Sure, sure, sure. And any any of your people, anytime interested, any training activities, you can always connect with us. You know, we are very open to, we are in fact started doing training activities in a systematic way. COVID is over, We now that we are organizing ourselves in a better way. So we will Thank remain you. connected, of course. Sure. Professor Ajit Bide, we are in connect with him all the time. So absolutely no problem, sir. Sure. Okay, Thank sir. Bide, sir. Okay. Bye bye, sir. Okay.